Okay, hi everyone. Welcome back to English 484W. So we're really in the kind of the home stretch of the course here. So I'll try to keep these lecture videos a little bit short. Um, so you guys have more time to uh, get into this 350-page uh, novel, which uh, does have some things going for it that we haven't really encountered in the course so far. So hopefully it's a little bit of a nice kind of change up from what we've been reading so far. Uh, mostly around that there's kind of different perspectives, different characters in this book, which has kind of been lacking in a lot of the stuff that we've covered, which has been kind of uh, very from like a single person's perspective, a lot of it, uh, the autofiction or uh, you, which is uh, kind of claustrophobically, we're ensconced in uh, Joe's consciousness. So um, there's definitely some different things going on in this novel. And uh, yeah, I'm curious what you guys think about it. Uh, uh, it's kind of a satire of millennial culture to a certain degree. Um, and yeah, uh, kind of very pretentious, but uh, it's also being described as like one of the big kind of millennial novels. So kind of building off, uh, talking a little bit about mel millennial melancholia last week and looking at uh, Mira Gonzalez's book of poetry. So I'm just going to get into my PowerPoint here. Okay, so this week, what I, what I wanted to talk about was uh, the meta. Um, and the meta is, uh, if, if you're not aware, it's kind of, uh, the example that comes to mind for me is the movie uh, Synecdoche, New York, which is uh, about the, the making of a uh, play, but the play, the whole making of the play, the directing of the play, the staging of the play, that becomes the plot of the movie. And at various points in the film, steadily as it goes along, the the plot of the play that's being staged and the plot of the movie, the plot of the main character's lives all begin to kind of meld together. So the meta is basically just uh, in fiction. It's when a when a text kind of breaks that fourth wall and kind of gestures to its status as a text or, text or as a novel. And there is a moment in Private Citizens where that kind of occurs. Uh, there's multiple moment, moments, but in the first hundred pages, when the character of Linda is attending the, the creative writing workshop, um, she receives this criticism about her work, which I think uh, is also kind of a criticism of, a potential criticism, criticism of Tula Timute's work. So uh, here's the, the criticism of Linda's writing from the 27-year-old instructor, um, I guess the concern there would be that the story becomes like a prank, saying, nya nya, see, I'm smarter than you. No one's saying it's bad, it's just a chilly, sort of valueless sensibility. Sure, Linda said, if you didn't consider taste a value. Okay, Linda, since you don't seem to respond to even-handed critique, I'm going to put this out there. The ironic, too cool, meta satire, the sneering and mocking, is actually just a contemporary version of the bourgeois sentimentality it's trying to mock. It's not new, really, it's almost quaint. The backlash has already outlasted it. But the real problem is that it's self-indulgent. Um, so I think uh, Amrit kind of mentioned this uh, in his discussion questions that, so Tony Tulutamute, the author of this work, is a Stanford grad. He's writing about four different Stanford grads. Uh, and they all come off in different ways, a little bit pretentious. Um, and the, that pretentiousness at the level of the characters, it's also mimicked at the level of the writing style. So Tony Tula Tamute makes no kind of uh, effort to kind of hide his kind of uh, Stanford level pretentiousness. And it comes across in his writing in terms of you kind of having to, or at least myself having to read this book with a a phone by my side so I can Google a word every couple sentences, what it means. Uh, I guess it's good for expanding my vocabulary, but the novel is kind of very pretentious. It is kind of self-indulgent, and the writing style does kind of mimic the, the characters of the text. Okay, so I just want to go through different kind of valences of the term meta and how they all kind of factor into this book. So the first one is metaphors, so big kind of uh, literary device, um, but they have a special relationship to media. And I think I've said this quote before from the Canadian, very influential Canadian me media theorist, Marshall McLuhan, uh, that all media are active metaphors and their power to translate experience into new form. 
So basically that just means that media like our computers, our phones, they aren't just tools that we use to kind of access the world, um, but they also kind of, uh, basically they're not just external kind of objects, but they also kind of integrate themselves into our, our very subjectivity. Uh, so even when we're not using phones or not using computers, we still kind of uh, at times process the world like we are using our phones or computers. Like uh, perhaps we go on a hike and uh, we don't have our phone with us and we see a beautiful landscape and we think, wow, this would make a great Instagram post. Um, so we're not using our phone, but we're still looking at the world through the lens, uh, through the metaphorical lens of our, the technology that we use every day. So this kind of calls back to, I think, Dowlin's Taipei. Uh, there's kind of a lot of metaphors that he uses in that text that kind of show that the character of Paul uh, totally uh, sees the world through kind of technology and metaphors. Um, one time, uh, his kind of facial expression goes AFK, like he just kind of disappears from his own face. Um, and that AFK away from keyboard, that's the way that he describes it. Um, on page, uh, I think, 60 to 60, it goes on to 62 of my copy, um, when Will is talking to his girlfriend Vanya, uh, he uses a series of metaphors to kind of describe their conversation. And I found it pretty funny. So uh, at one point when he says something kind of uh, problematic, he wants to uh, say, uh, he wants to do command Z, undo. He wants to kind of uh, preserve the relationship when it's going through kind of a bit of a rocky point in this conversation. He wants to uh, command S, save. Um, and then finally on page 62, he wants to minimize and then quit uh, this kind of, this awkward conversation that, that they're having. So this he processes this conversation completely through these kind of uh, little commands that we do on our computer. And um, yeah, I think there's like the Adam Sandler movie Click where the main character has like a TV remote and he can kind of control his life through like fast forward and rewind and pause. I've only watched the trailer. I didn't actually watch the actual film, but I'm surprised there isn't kind of like a computer movie that's like that, where we can kind of control life through these uh, computational functions. So that's metaphors. Uh, the next meta, this is a very kind of meta presentation, is metadata. So again, kind of sticking with the character of Will, uh, he comprises the spreadsheet. And in the character of Will, you can kind of see the, the kind of the beginnings of the character of the feminist a little bit. Um, they are kind of a little bit similar characters. Um, and on page 56, Will talks about completing this spreadsheet of all the women <laughs> that have ever rejected him. Um, and I think it's like 100, 100 or so women. Um, and I'm just going to read this whole passage because it's pretty funny again. The spreadsheet's completeness gratified him. Metadata were honest. His rejections and sheer volume were not insignificant. In fact, they were statistically significant. Um, beside each female friend, he entered the date of his encounter, approximate date of rejection, and her height, age, race, ethnicity, and estimates of income, weight, IQ. The doorbell rang, and he ignored it. On a Likert scale, he rated his subjective attraction and fondness, post-rejection heartbreak, and its duration. He downloaded a data visualization app and plotted the entries into dynamic line graphs and best foot clusters, coaxing them into meaning. Some of the results intrigued him. The intensity of his remorse trended with height, and high intelligence correlated to his subjective attraction, but smart girls rejected him quickest. The data were glaringly silent on the most important questions, where he lacked in general, and what in particular. Um, skipping along here. He re-rated the factors, diddled the confidence. It was garbage. All women appeared equally likely to reject him for any reason, which seemed pessimistic even by his standards. These weren't startling data-driven insights. They only quantified what he knew. He let out the uh, chesty belch of a veteran bachelor, got up from the rec recliner after a few attempts, and walked back to his computer desk, overwrote the spreadsheet with a seven-pass erase, and deactivated his social network accounts. No more of that. No more knowing. So... It is interesting that uh, 
the character of Will in order to figure out the reasons or the meaning behind this kind of uh, series of rejections, he turns to metadata. So trying to analyze by like some kind of calcul calculative mathematical uh, analysis, the reasons for his kind of lack of uh, successful romances up until uh, Vanya. So metadata is kind of where he turns to for, for meaning. Um, but I mean, we can't kind of just isolate this trait to, to Will because uh, his partner, Vanya, uh, when she meets Will, as he kind of snoops, again, this kind of snooping into her diary. Uh, so Vanya describes their kind of first encounter in her diary. Tomorrow night date, boy from Lanny's party. Uh, Will, get last name for Goog, Diligence, Stanford. Works in tech, Asian, Thai, smart, cute. So the way that Vanya frames their first encounter, it is, again, this kind of metadata. So nothing really kind of, uh, I don't know, some kind of um, actually kind of interesting substance to him. He's just kind of plotted as this kind of, uh, in terms of his kind of like external traits. Um, so, yeah, I mean, this is kind of something that we've seen kind of throughout the course, um, this lack of kind of interest in a person's substance and more just their kind of uh, external traits, uh, particularly particularly when we're looking at, uh, I guess, the, the Tinder, Tinder short stories. Okay, so this is the kind of the final meta uh, word that I want to look at, and this is kind of an invented term uh, by, I mentioned her last week. Uh, she was an MA student in SFU's humanities program. Uh, she wrote a really good thesis uh, kind of on internet culture. Uh, you can access it through SFU Library, and it's called Symbolic uh, Collisions. So in this thesis, she kind of, yeah, invented this term metaspectacle. And I'll just read this quote. Through all this, every participant is engaged in one way or another with the metaspectacle. Some watch others watching another, some watch others watching them, and some watch the other watching herself. All are hypnotized by the amputation and extension of our collective being in its new technical form. And again, another quote from uh, McLuhan there. And just as an example of this, I have the TV show Terrace House, which I was a pretty big fan of. I think I mentioned that all the way back in our, in our first class. Um, I mean, and even not to get too meta, but um, you guys are currently, if you were, hopefully you're watching this lecture, you're watching me watch my lecture slides. So there is kind of a meta element even going on in this presentation. Um, but yeah, in Terrace House, uh, one of the kind of the innovations, uh, at least to Western audiences, was that there was, so there was a reality show, but then there was also, as pictured here, the presence of the guests, I mean, the hosts. So these hosts, the audience would watch them watching the show and then commenting on it. So there's this kind of distance that we then get uh, from the reality show in that these hosts kind of operate to, uh, I don't know, as kind of a mediation uh, in terms of what the reality show p people are doing. Um, we're kind of protected from having to have like the, the final say in what they're doing. Uh, because there's this kind of mediatory presence of the host that kind of provide the commentary for us. So even going back to when I talked a little bit about interpassivity, uh, that's definitely going on here as well, um, that we don't have to really even watch the show. We can just watch other people watching the show. So there's something kind of very attractive about this. Um, I mean, it's still kind of really super popular. Uh, with kind of Twitch, the Let's Play, watching people play video games. Um, there's like reaction videos on YouTube, so you watch people react uh, to other kind of, hopefully there aren't videos where you can watch people react to a reaction video. Uh, but that seems, seems to be where things are trending. And definitely that occurs in Private Citizens with the way in which, uh, so the characters of Will and Vanya, uh, they definitely kind of immerse themselves into this kind of culture of meta-spectacle. Um, by eventually they begin to participate in this kind of live stream, live streaming of their lives. And um, to a lesser degree, Will also sets up surveillance, a surveillance system in his girlfriend's 
apartment in New York. Oh my God. It's just, it, some of the stuff in this book is just, uh, I guess it's interesting, but it's also just like, oh my God, this relationship just seems impossibly toxic and just awful. Um, but yeah, there's definitely kind of, they kind of eventually when you get to it, they do kind of immerse themselves into this, uh, meta spectacle. Um, and yeah, I, just, I really like this work. So I'm going to keep quoting from it. Uh, and yet for the online consumer, this does not matter because life in digital meta enclaves, despite being chaotic, isolating and alienating is consistently denser, quicker, and more alive than the offline world. Um, so this comes up uh, on page 127, and again, sticking with Will, uh, and Will kind of describes this kind of hatred of the outside. Um, it was just ugly outdoors, sidewalks with their stubble beards of filth, scabby trees pregnant with vermin, weeping sap, stewing in dog piss. Sure, it was nice to have some fresh air while he smoked, but he was myopic, hard of hearing, congested. Reality was low-fi slow and obstructing, too cold or too bright, filled with scrapes, sirens, hidden charges, long distances, pollen, and assholes. So real life kind of to Will sucks. And as you kind of read about his kind of internet behaviors, uh, there's a part in the book where he browses, or I don't know what he's doing, but he spends a whole week on the internet, uh, mostly on kind of just porn websites, just a week kind of disappears in this kind of uh, internet binge session and again not to just kind of isolate him as this kind of internet monster but I mean he is maybe perhaps reflective of kind of more common behaviors uh, at an extreme level I mean I think a lot of us kind of participate in internet binging uh, in different ways where kind of real life does seem kind of uh, less exciting than what's going on on the internet Okay, and then this, this is just the final slide. So meta, 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 meta. And um, uh, Wolf quotes from David Foster Wallace in this photo that really looks kind of meta for some reason. It looks fake, um, or <laughs> very strange. Uh, but yeah, David Foster Wallace was a very kind of famous American novelist. And a lot of private citizens has been kind of compared to uh, DFW, his writing style. Um, so Again, I'll just kind of read out this quote because I think it's interesting. Wallace remarks that as we consume higher and higher doses of meta entertainment, we begin to start watching ourselves, watching, retreating into ourselves, becoming vastly more spectatorial and self-conscious, heightening levels of alienation, solipsism, and loneliness. The separation that nostalgia, irony, and the meta afford is not without cost. While these strategies protect consciousness from the trauma of sincerity, Vulnerability, vulnerability, they also alienate consciousness from itself and barricade the ego inside itself. Affecting a casual, ironic, or det detached demeanor is in, is in the end still a defense mechanism. So yeah, uh, the meta um, is kind of an escape for us um, in terms of our actual kind of responsibility for our everyday selves. Um, when we kind of analyze ourselves kind of endlessly, um, we can kind of spiral. It can be a form of escapism from actually kind of um, taking responsibility for the people that we are in everyday life. And one of the examples, looking back at past course texts, was the feminist. So the feminist, uh, just kind of as that text unfolded, he just became more and more meta in kind of analyzing why he was continually rejected. I mean, he and to eventually progressing to the level where uh, he was participating in that online forum where um, his kind of rejection from romance was continually explained to him by the internet. Um, so where that kind of occurs the most in Private Citizens, I just have a quote when Henrik is talking to the sex worker. Um, she has different names, Lucretia, I believe. Um, so he's, he's paying for sex for the first time and yeah, as kind of an escape, escapism from that act, uh, which isn't like a inherently negative act or anything, but his kind of self-analysis just goes kind of 
uh, a little bit manic to the point where he removes himself from the situation that he's actually participating in through this kind of constant, unending self-analysis. So just reading what he says to Lucretia, I just wanted to get on the same page before we, you know, bruh. I guess I wanted to make sure you're comfortable. I mean, comfortable in the sense that you know this isn't some meaningless recreational thing. But it's not a serious thing either. Mainly, I feel respect. I respect you a lot for this, and I want to make that known even if there is a valid, valid argument to be made that this is an inherently exploitative exchange. There's that cliche scenario of the sensitive white guy finding redemption and authenticity in a sex worker, and I don't want to use you in that way or any other way. I'm also trying not to make it your responsibility to absolve me of any of the shame I'm concerned I might feel. That's not in your job description. So if this is exhausting, I apologize for that too. So these kind of continual apologies for being potentially problematic. Um, it's just kind of, um, I think like walking outside in some ways always going to be a little bit problematic. Um, so this kind of continual escape into these like apologies for everything. Um, yeah, it's just this way of kind of escaping from the situation and just continue. I try to be aware of rape issues and sex worker issues. And I know is rape, rape is pretty much whatever feels like rape, which is I wanted to, which is, which is why I want to make completely sure. And then Lucretia, Henrik, stop, stop, stop. You're way overthinking everything. Let me guess. This is your first time. Um, so yeah, Lucretia, who, uh, Henrik is trying to make feel better. Um, at the same time, he takes up so much, I don't want to just kind of speak in this jargon, but he does just take up so much space in trying to make himself himself kind of feel better about the action that he's participating by these kind of levels of constant remove. Um, and this is kind of something that kind of aff afflicts, I think, all kind of millennials to a certain extent. Um, so this, I mean, I think someone described us as being in this kind of post-ironic stage where we're past irony. Um, but if you go on the internet, you do see people still kind of posting things that are ironic. I mean, they say things that they're operating a certain remove from them or a certain distance or detachment from what they're saying. Um, so yeah, and um, it is this kind of um, a way of kind of hiding from from being vulnerable. I mean, it's very easy to be on the internet um, and not ever be vulnerable because a lot of it is kind of uh, one of the students uh, of this class was talking about in their essay, uh, a lot of it kind of involves this kind of scopophilia. So just watching other people and ourselves not being kind of seen uh, or being vulnerable. And I mean, that definitely affects the character of Will, uh, who enjoys watching other people uh, to, an, uh, to an extreme degree. Um, and yeah, at some point when he's doing this, he does say that he does feel lucky that um, these people that he's watching on the screen or reading on the screen, they can't see him or read him. Um, so the internet definitely plays a part in effect, in affecting this casual, ironic or detached demeanor, um, as kind of a defense mechanism as Wolf writes. So, so yeah, I just wanted to keep this week's presentation a little bit short. So that's all I kind of wanted to talk about this week. Um, so yeah, uh, I'll see you guys in the Discord and also for our Wednesday Zoom session with Mira Gonzalez. I'm still super excited about that. And yeah, if you guys have any questions, not to be meta, but if you guys have any questions about the questions, you're supposed to be uh, uh, coming to that Zoom question, uh, Zoom session with, um, feel free to email me. So yeah, uh, uh, I hope you guys have a good week and I'll see you guys on Wednesday. Bye for now.